welcome to this. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar on uh, the Brazilian customs. Uh, I'm Rodrigo dos Santos, Trade and Investment Commissioner here in Brazil, appointed by the Wallonia Export and Investment Agency. And the next will I my colleagues van Fit and the Vlaamse bedrijven welcome. And hartelijk dank dus voor de voor jullie deelname aan dit webinar en voor de mooie samenwerking. Et puis bien sûr, je souhaite la bienvenue au nom de la WEX aux sociétés bruxelloises et, et wallonnes qui se sont jointes à ce séminaire ô combien important pour tout exportateur. Merci à Hub Brussels pour aussi son efficace collaboration, tout, tout comme nos collègues de, de FIT. Et clair, também, non pas de l'échelle de diriger mes palabras en, en portugais, e em especial a Agnes Bodes, presidente da, da Câmara de Comércio Brasileira uh, na Bélgica, e ao Felipe Cabral, que nos acompanha hoje uh, neste webinar como orador. Uh, as a short introduction, you know that uh, Brazil is a major world economy and the largest in Latin America, despite a sharp decline in, in GDP value from uh, 2 trillion euro, um, US dollars in 2017 to a little bit less than 1.5 trillion in 2020 for a population of 212 million inhabitants. It enjoys a fairly good political and economic stability, despite some shocks here and, uh, and there, uh, among others, as far as the business environment and the convertibility of the local currency are concerned. The situation in Brazil is a little bit less favorable as in Mexico. I've just checked the Credendo, Credendo uh, website, but still the, over, the overall picture is fairly good. And uh, consequently, in the opinion of the regional agencies organizing uh, this webinar and the Brascam, Brazil is a market that deserves our interest both in the B2C and the B2B uh, markets. And, as I can see by the number of participants today, we are around 79 viewers. It seems that you all share um, the same analysis. Today's topic will deal with uh, the Brazilian customs procedures, as, uh, as you know. It's quite an issue. It's not an issue only in Brazil, but in Brazil uh, it can be a, quite a problem. And the Brazilian customs procedures, um, well, Although it's a problem, it doesn't mean that it's totally impossible to export. And to prove that, uh, if you look at uh, the Belgian goods exported to Brazil, worth uh, around 3.9 billion uh, euros in 2021, we are still waiting for the final numbers. Um, clearly, it's not impossible. It's just a matter of good preparation. And in any circumstances, there is always a way out. And the point is to find the best solution with as little costs and time consuming for, uh, as possible for the companies. Uh, as you can imagine, in one hour time, it's virtually impossible to tackle all details, but at least you will be able to listen to some good uh, advice by uh, our experts uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, witnessing, uh, witnessed by uh, Belgian companies that have already gone through the process and that can witness their experience on the ground. The experts of today's webinar um, are the following. Karin Willems, at least we have a lady as a speaker today. Um, Karin is the Duan Attaché at the Belgian Embassy in Brasilia and someone of great help uh, to Belgian companies who sometimes have um, tricky questions and technical questions about some procedures. Thank you, Karin, uh, for being with us. Secondly, we'll have uh, Felipe Cabral. Uh, he's an experienced custom, customs agent. He runs a family company of around 190 people, and these people are present at all entry points in Brazil. Has witnessed companies, uh, it's my pleasure to name uh, Michel Rezen. Uh, he will witness his experience through a video because he's about to board uh, onto a flight to South Africa for business purpose. Uh, so we wish him uh, a nice flight to South Africa. And the second witness, who is also traveling, but this time to Germany, is David Andreoli. He also recorded a video for us 
and is an expert, I can say so, because he exports a lot of foodstuff from Belgium and Italy to Brazil. Uh, and he has also a company in, in Brazil. And the third one, and not the least uh, expert, is Leonardo Mella. He's a legal and tax manager at Curatos, a very well-known Belgian company, very much active around the world, around the world in uh, the field of food um, ingredients. But before we proceed with uh, the presentations, uh, my excellent and very professional colleagues here in Brazil, Dix Campela and Dieter Polen will briefly present you the coming trade missions and their programs uh, for the Brazilian market. Um, the, the actions they will be, uh, in short, organizing in the coming months this year. Uh, we will also listen to Agnes Bosch, uh, the president of the Brazilian Belgian Chamber um, here in, in, in Belgium. Um, so my colleagues and myself, we are now expressing and uh, speaking from Brazil. It's uh, 12 uh, p.m. So it's 4 p.m. in Belgium, so that you can see there is some time difference. And I think we'll start right now with the first uh, speaker, uh, my colleague of FIT agency, Dirk Schampelar. And I will ask my colleague Lucia or Evelyn to show his presentation on the screen. So the floor is yours, Dirk. Huge. OK, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we okay, can hear you. Perfect. All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, many thanks, uh, Rodrigo, for uh, your kind introduction. So, Flanders Investment and Trade. So, I'm heading here uh, the office in uh, Sao Paulo. Here we have a team of uh, five persons uh, uh, at your disposal. Um, so, what, what's on? Um, What's on the roadmap? What's on the radar screen? Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Tu, le, le slide suivant. Oui. Lucia. Oh, voilà. Merci. Okay. So finally, after uh, two years of uh, COVID, uh, we are back to business and we are back to uh, trade missions and uh, fairs. So the First one is uh, our multi-sexual trade fair, uh, which is going to happen uh, within uh, two months from now, 22nd to 26th of May. Um, so first of all, uh, anticipating one of uh, your, the questions you might have, the, I would say that the COVID situation in Brazil is uh, under control. I think uh, the last uh, six months, uh, the measures being taken here have been more uh, rigid, more stringent than uh, the ones taken in, uh, in, in Belgium. So I think uh, the COVID risk uh, here uh, is basically uh, at this moment uh, non-existent. So that should not be a hurdle uh, to consider. Um, so this multi-sectoral mission is open to everybody and uh, the due date to uh, subscribe is uh, 31st of uh, March. So you still have uh, a few weeks um, to uh, subscribe uh, to this one. Next one is uh, a newcomer. Um, no, no, previous slide, please. And um, so next one is CIOFs. Um, that's in the first time we do participate to CIOFs. Uh, why do we do so? Um, the agro sector and uh, specifically everything related to livestock is one of the few sectors which have, even during the pandemic, uh, have been showing a tremendous growth. So um, uh, taking into account this and the amount of questions we got related to livestock uh, related products, so we decided to participate here for the first time. Um, the inscription was launched today, so uh, that's why maybe you didn't see it yet. And the um, inscription is, uh, well, the deadline is uh, June the 1st, so you still have some time. Uh, just um, 
to show you who will be there. So for the persons who are active in the sector, I just tell you that uh, the major, the giant players uh, like BRF, GBF and GPS will be also present with a booth in um, the uh, sphere. So next one, please. So about the multisectoral trade missions, right? it's basically about uh, setting up B2Bs. Um, so just for the information, although Sao Paulo is uh, logically uh, the industrial hub, this is there's no geographical limitation. You go where there's business and we will set up the meetings for you. Uh, there are three common events, a kickoff meeting, uh, a uh, seminar the first day, and the reception at the consulate general's uh, residence, uh, followed by a dinner on Tuesday. But for the rest, you're free. If you want to stay longer, that's also possible. Next one. You can see uh, what's the fee. Uh, it's 500 for the first participant, 250 for the additional one. Uh, next one, please. So we have uh, a deal with a very nice hotel, uh, the Tivoli, which uh, is in the center of Sao Paulo. It's quite safe neighborhood. Uh, it's also sometimes a question we receive. Uh, so this is an absolutely safe neighborhood and a nice one. Uh, next one, please. So CFs. Uh, so this is the biggest trade fair on poultry and pork. So. Um, just to give you an example of how it's growing, this uh, session will be 30% uh, bigger than the, the, the last one. Uh, so we have a small booth, it's the first time we participate of 75 square meters, uh, which will be uh, allocated uh, on the first come, first serve, first come, first serve basis, sorry. And uh, we'll be, uh, just in front of the booth of uh, GBF. Uh, I cannot guarantee we will serve any Belgium beer or food. Uh, that still depends on the, the COVID measurements taken by the organizers, but we will try to do uh, our best. So next one. So what do we offer? Um, so it's basically a product sample booth uh, where we have three square meters per company. Uh, and the rates you can uh, see for yourself, uh, 1,000 for SMEs, 2,000 for non-SMEs. Individual booths are, are available on request. And the deadline for the subscription is June 1st. So I think I used up uh, my available uh, time slot. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, uh, most of uh, the participants in the webinar. Uh, within a few months here in Sao Paulo. So I wish you a very good continuation, uh, continuation of this webinar. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Hartelijk -bye. dank, Dirk. Perfect. And I, I must tell to the participants that you have negotiated a very good rate because normal rate at Tivoli is much higher. Okay. So good job, Dirk. Next speaker is uh, Dieter Polein. Uh, and we all wish him welcome because he's a new colleague here in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, someone of a very long experience in the private sector. So uh, he will be of great help for Brussels companies, Brussels based companies. Welcome and the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Do you, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So thanks, Rodrigo, for this uh, introduction. And, and I'm ha very happy to have the opportunity and share this interesting topic. Uh, I will first uh, give you a short introduction. Uh, my name is Dieter Polein. I have been recently appointed Trade and Investment Commissioner for Hub Brussels in Brazil. I'm uh, pleased to introduce also my colleague who is in the audience, uh, Florence Lanzmann, uh, who is Area Manager for South America and South Europe. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So, first of all, I'm previous one. Thanks. First of all, I'm pleased to say that our agency is back in Brazil uh, during the pandemic, and for some time, the follow up for companies was done uh, from abroad, which was, of course, a challenge. Uh, and sometimes, of course, we could do also with the help of AWACS. 
Uh, last year, the decision was taken to move our hub office uh, from Rio de Janeiro to Sao Paulo, since Sao Paulo is the economic heart of this country. So we are here in Sao Paulo. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. For those who don't know Hub, um, we are a recently created agency in, since 2018, resulting from the merge of three entities, Brussels Invest Export, who covered international activities, Impulse, who looked after the launch and development of uh, companies in Brussels, and Atrium, who looked after the retail activities within our city region. One of the ideas behind the merge was to connect the local actors of Brussels economy uh, with an international network of economic and trade representatives across the world and, of course, uh, create synergies with that. Our agency today has close to 100,000 companies to look after in their development, among which we find some uh, 4,000 exporters. Companies like yours uh, could be large and well-known companies, but also SMEs, entrepreneurs, startups, scales up, scale up. Next slide, please. Our presence in Brazil dates back from uh, the years 2000. As part of our interregional agreements, our Rio de Janeiro office was, has been extremely instrumental in generating and handling the opportunities which emerged around the Olympic Games in 2016. Now, uh, in this year, 2022, we are opening a new phase of our development uh, with our forthcoming opening of our brand new office in Sao Paulo next quarter. Next slide, please. At this stage, um, we are building our plan for the next three years in Brazil, and uh, we'll be sharing soon with those who are interested uh, more details about this plan. What I can mention already is that our intention is to place emphasis on innovative activities and also, of course, keep in mind our Brussels DNA regarding the economic transition to a more sustainable future. Our clusters in Brussels are there to assist those companies which can benefit from interesting exchanges with their respective ecosystems. Our our colleagues in Brussels and also here now in Sao Paulo will be very happy to assist you in your export projects to Brazil. Um, to conclude, next slide, please. Uh, you will find our coordinates there. Do not uh, hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, we are here to support your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Dieter, uh, for your very good presentation. And the next floor, the floor is to Agnes Borch, President of the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce in Belgium. The floor is in your. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure for Brascom to organize this webinar together and alongside with the three Belgium agencies. Um, our chamber is based in Belgium and has been active for many years promoting business activities between Belgium, Luxembourg and Brazil. At our chamber, we decided to took these two years of pandemic to rebuild and restructure ourselves. You have a new board in place. We have a new branding that's first time being used in this webinar. Uh, and then also we decide to focus more in a business oriented activities next to the events that you usually promote and usually organize it. We want to be more pragmatic and more dynamic um, in that sense, we'd like to go more into sectoral business around. Uh, we are going now to start to do more market studies, not only from the Brazilian entrepreneurs going to Belgium, but the other way around as well. So it's a, a new revamp of the chamber, more dynamic, more aligned with the business needs, the current business needs that we have. Um, we are going to keep our events online and also presential one. We hope this year to resume our network activities. We have an annual feijoada that we normally host together with the Brazilian Embassy here in Belgium. It's a very popular event and very good network that you should stop for two years because of COVID. We hope this year to relaunch this type of activity as well. In addition, we are rebuilding 
in our website. In our website, we are going to have uh, podcasts, newsletters, uh, more information, more free flow of information on Brazil, uh, Brazilian economy, and also some um, articles on, on, on legal aspects, on tax aspects in Belgium. We have a lot of um, companies come to us, small companies that want to be established in Belgium as well. Um, I think that's the that's this. You should expect more activity for this this chamber, especially in this election year. We should be there for provide hands-on information what's going on on political and also economic side in Brazil to give this information mo mostly for the the Belgium and Luxembourg audience. So that's it, um, Rodrigo. Turn back to you. Thank you, Agnes, for your presentation about the activities of uh, the Brascam. Um, so I forgot to mention that if you have any question, feel free to type down your question. And of course, at the end of, at the end of all presentations, we're mostly glad um, to answer them. Um, so I will go on with our own program of action. Uh, so you have here a picture, it's not a Brazilian picture, it's not it's not a place here in Brazil, it's, it's Namur, the cozy city of Namur. Uh, next slide. And um, just for the speakers, if you see that the, the slides are going slowly, it's because we are experiencing some problems. So my colleague Sylvian has just sent me a message saying that there is some technical problem in, in having the, the, the slides following each other. So be patient. Um, as far as um, our trade missions are concerned, we try to have a holistic approach on the industrial uh, sector. Uh, industry, the industrial sector in, in, in Brazil is quite import, import, important. And as you know, you probably, most of you know, uh, the, the, the plane builder, uh, Ambraer. So it's, it's a big, very good example of how good the Brazilian industry can be. Uh, if they want to, and we want to, to, to tackle this sector. And to do this, we have organized a month ago a webinar on the industrial goods and services in Brazil. Uh, we had some witness by balloon companies already established in Brazil for a long time, and that could deliver uh, a speech full of good advice when uh, a Belgian company wants to tackle this sector here in Brazil. Uh, today, it's, uh, of course, we are organizing together with our uh, regional colleagues from Flanders and Brussels a webinar on uh, Brazilian, Brazilian customs. And the most important trade mission that we will organize uh, after this webinar is the participation to the ABM Trade Show and Congress, which is uh, uh, quite a big show and uh, organized by the, the Brazilian Association of uh, the metal industry, the mineral industry, and the materials industry. So we'll be there with around six volume companies, and uh, this, this will take place in uh, next June. Next slide, please. After the industrial sector, we wanted also to tackle uh, another interesting sector, which is the digital one. And after a first participation uh, on the virtual edition of Smart City Curitiba, we are now having a stand uh, in Curitiba at Espo Berigi, where, where we will showcase uh, some uh, well-known companies and the digital solutions they can provide in the field of smart city. Um, the next one will be uh, in the health sector. Uh, in a trade show called Hospitalar, which will be most probably the last year that we will participate in, in, in this trade show. It's organized in the northern part of uh, Sao Paulo, and uh, we will have a small booth uh, with some information about balloon solutions in the field of the health sector, mainly meant for hospitals. And the last um, trade mission that we will organize in, is in the food sector, and it's called Delicious Wallonia. Uh, so we were supposed to organize it already last year, but because of the COVID, it was not really possible. And why was it not possible? Because we, will, we want to showcase uh, Walloon foodstuff products and 
there is no point in participating in the trade mission if you cannot have those products tasted. These are new products on the Brazilian market and people need to touch it, to see it, to smell it and to eat it. And we, if we cannot do it, so there is no point in organizing it. So we are eagerly waiting for the moment that we can have some tasting um, in a, a big uh, supermarket and uh, we will put all those products to the Brazilian public and clients of this supermarket chain. And that's all on my side for the Volunia Export and the Investment Agency. Here you have some contacts. Uh, my desk, the desk officer for the medical school market in Chile is Silvian van Boxtel. She's with us today. She's uh, following me uh, on this uh, webinar and myself here in, uh, in Sao Paulo since September 2020 was a very good moment to arrive in Brazil, indeed. So that's it. And I think we will go on now with the most important part of this webinar. And we will start with the first export in the matter, which is with Karin, Karin Willems, in, uh, in good French and in, in good Dutch, Karin Willems. She is the Douane Attaché at the Belgian Embassy, Embassy in Brasilia and has a long experience um, in uh, customs procedures as far as Brazil is concerned. Karin, the floor okay. is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo uh, for having me. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Karin and uh, I'm the Belgian customs attaché to, to Brazil, which uh, basically means uh, that I represent uh, the Belgian General Administration on Customs and Excise here in Brazil. So I'm based in Brasilia at the Belgian Embassy. Next slide, please. So maybe this is the most important slide of the presentation because you have my contact uh, details here. Uh, when we look at uh, my tasks from a commercial point of view, I can sum up uh, three, of, three of them. Uh, in the first place, uh, my task is to inform Belgian or Brazilian companies uh, with regard to customs related issues. So I will um, inform Belgian companies that will uh, export to Brazil, as well as Brazilian companies that want to export uh, to Belgium on customs uh, related issues which can be like, for instance, what are the taxes that we have to pay uh, in Belgium when we import Brazilian product? Um, uh, it can also be a question uh, on the reverse side. Uh, what customs procedure uh, do we need to follow when we import our goods into Brazil from Belgium and so on? So just to give you an example. Then I also uh, try to provide some help uh, to Belgian or Brazilian companies when their um, containers get stuck in the Brazilian or Belgian ports or uh, their shipments. It can always happen because uh, you don't have a document attached to the uh, customs declaration that was required, uh, for instance, uh, an uh, import certificate or, or something else or something is wrong uh, with uh, the package of your goods the wood doesn't have uh, the correct stamp or something like that so what i will do then is uh, i will contact the competent authority in belgium or in brazil and uh, i will ask them what is wrong with your shipment why uh, has it been blocked and uh, I will also ask them, what can we do about it? What documents do you need? Or what is possible in terms of uh, re-export or uh, to another country if the document cannot be provided or the certificate is not correct uh, at that time? Uh, so in the third place, I also represent uh, the Belgian Customs Administration at commercial or informative events uh, like this one. However, uh, I cannot represent you or I cannot represent your company 
before any official institution in Brazil, neither uh, can I act as your lawyer. Uh, so um, please uh, keep that in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when you want to export your goods to Brazil, uh, the first question that you have to ask yourself, uh, will it be a permanent or a temporary export? A permanent export is an export. Uh, it means that the goods will stay on a permanent basis uh, in Brazil. A temporary one is uh, that the goods will be uh, temporarily uh, imported into the country. Um, I give an example, uh, for instance, a horse uh, that uh, will do competition here, jumping competition in Brazil. Uh, sometimes it's only imported here in Brazil on a temporary basis, and it will be re-exported uh, to Belgium after the competition uh, is done. So um, what is uh, very important uh, for the temporary export that you have to keep in mind that the carne ATA uh, no longer exists uh, for Brazil from the 1st of uh, January 2022. So uh, the carne ATA, for those who are not familiar with the document, it was a very uh, easy procedure uh, to do a temporary import here in Brazil because all the administrative uh, requirements were done already in Belgium and you just had to present the carne ATA of that specific document to the Brazilian customs. They would put a stamp on it and afterwards they would control it when the goods were re-exported uh, to Belgium if they were the same goods that were re-exported as the ones that came in. So, uh, but uh, we cannot use it anymore. Uh, you can still do a temporary import, of course, in Brazil, but then you will have to uh, adhere to the normal customs rules on temporary import. Then uh, also you may ask your uh, question, uh, what are the ways to export to Brazil? Well, uh, we basically have uh, the export uh, by vessel, uh, container vessel, for example. Uh, this is uh, normally used when you have uh, machinery uh, to be exported uh, to Brazil. And uh, also yeah, boxes uh, that can be put in a container, uh, big quantities. And uh, then the other uh, way to export to Brazil is via airway. Uh, you can always uh, use um, planes, but uh, it's only for smaller quantities. Some also, also sometimes for uh, live animals like horses, they, they put them in the container, but then the container uh, goes on the airplane. And uh, the document uh, that will be provided there by the carrier, the airway carrier or uh, the vessel carrier will be uh, for the vessel, the bill of lading and for the airplane, it will be the airway bill. And this is uh, basically a contract uh, between the consigner of the goods and the transporter of the goods. And it contains a lot of uh, information on the goods, uh, how many, uh, the, the, yeah, uh, the number of boxes, uh, etc. Um, the, um, the origin of the goods and also the destination. So uh, which one to choose? Uh, it also has to do with uh, time and money. Uh, you must think in terms of a vessel that it will uh, take about three weeks uh for the vessel to arrive from antwerp in brazil and for the airplane yeah that will be more than uh, 11 hours uh, something like that but the airplane is very convenient of course when it comes to the import of uh, fruits into brazil like our uh, belgian pears next slide please so uh, when you start to export and uh, on the Belgian side and to import on the Brazilian side, uh, you will come into contact with a lot of uh, yeah, governmental authorities and agencies. The first ones are, um, of course, the customs administrations. 
uh, we have our general administration on customs and excise on the Belgian side, and our sister administration on the Brazilian side is the Receita Federal. Then uh, you may also come into contact uh, with the Federal Agency for the Safety of the Food Chain in Belgium, because sometimes you need an export certificate an export certificate, uh, for example, for uh, export of live horses, other uh, live animals, or dairy products or uh, other products uh, for uh, human consumption or for animal consumption. And then the sister administration on the Brazilian side of the Federal Agency for the Safety of the Food Chain in Belgium is on visa. Um, on the Brazilian side, we also have the MAPA, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and, uh, uh, and Livestock. And we also have in Metro, in Metro uh, yeah, sometimes they have to check uh, the safety of toys uh, that you want to import into Brazil. And the MAPA has also to do with a certificate for certain uh, food products or for live animals. And then on the Belgian side, uh, and uh, I hope uh, Dieter will not shoot me because I uh, forgot to put BC here, which is uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Brussels, but I will uh, adapt my presentation when I use it once again. Sorry for that. Uh, but uh, on the Walloon side, we have uh, Chambre de Commerce et d'Industrie. And on the Flemish side, uh, we have the Kamers van Koophandel. And uh, those uh, chambers of commerce, uh, they have always a kind of uh, section that deals with uh, international trade and that can uh, give you a lot of information. And sometimes uh, you will also come into contact with them because they have to um, give you uh, the certificate of origin of they have to validate it. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about the customs administration on the Brazilian side, we speak about the Receita Federal. The Receita Federal is a part of the Ministerio da Economia. Uh, in Belgium, the customs administration is uh, part of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, that is a little bit of difference. But when we talk about the Receita Federal, it's um, in fact the uh, federal income service um, of Brazil. Uh, it's not only the customs, but we also have uh, sections in there uh, that deal with um, taxes of companies, taxes of uh, yeah, uh, normal uh, physical persons and so on. So, but the term Receita Federal is also used to indicate uh, that, uh, um, yeah, uh, it's uh, to indicate uh, the um, Brazilian customs. Next slide, please. You, you still yes. have, you have three minutes. If you oh, have no. more slides. I will not get that. Maybe we will have to go to other slides. Uh, you Can you go to, uh, no, I will not comment on that. Um, you can go down. Next one. Yeah. No, 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 I will skip yeah. this. These ones, uh, the people have to look at it. No, no, uh, you can proceed, please. Yeah, uh, maybe it's uh, important to highlight this. When you have an export to Brazil, of course, you will have a Belgian exporter, you ha will have a Brazilian importer. On the Belgian side, first of all, uh, you will need an EORI number if you want to, to export. And export means then not send your goods to another uh, member state of the EU, but export in terms of the European Customs Union mean means that you export your goods to third country outside uh, the European Union. So uh, then, of course, you have to lodge a customs declaration and you can uh, therefore use a customs broker and that customs broker will use uh, will lodge your um, customs declaration, export declaration in our paperless system, uh, PLDA. Uh, the abbreviation stands for uh, paperless uh, customs um, in Belgium. So on the Brazilian side, you have the Brazilian importer. Of course, uh, you have to be 
to be able to import goods into Brazil, a company based in Brazil, uh, you will have to uh, have a CNPE, Cadastro Nacional uh, Pessoa Jurídica uh, number. And um, yeah, to lodge your customs declaration, you can also go to customs broker, which who will lodge it into the Cisco Mix uh, system. But if you want to export or import as a Brazilian company, you will need that habilitation uh, from the Receita Federal, which is called uh, the Radar. Okay, uh, that means that you are uh, that you get a yes from the Receita Federal to go ahead with import and export procedures. Next slide, please. So uh, the classification is very important of your product. When you export or import, you start with your export declaration. You have to uh, provide the CN or the combined nomenclature code in your export declaration in Belgium. This one is composed of eight digits. The first six digits are the HS code, and it's followed by uh, two other numbers, uh, seven and eight. But you can find more information on the link uh, that I have provided in the presentation. We go to the next slide. I speed a little bit up, sorry. Um, on the Brazilian side, uh, Brazil is part of the uh, customs union Mercosul uh, that uh, basically um, yeah, has uh, four countries, uh, now exists of four countries, which is Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay. And they have a kind of external tariff, uh, the tech. And of course, uh, they have also a nomenclatura commun do Mercosul. And it's basically, again, the six uh, first digits of the HS system, the harmonized system, which uh, was um, yeah, invented uh, by the World Customs Organization in Brussels. And then you still have two additional numbers, the sub item and the item number seven and eight, which are specifically for Brazil. So in fact, if you want to know the classification uh, code, just start with your Belgium or your European export code, your um, combined nomenclature code. You take the first six numbers and then you go to the website. Uh, of the Cisco Max, and you see what do they provide as a further classification uh, down the line. Next slide, please. So you can go uh, to this website uh, that I uh, have mentioned here on this slide. And in case of doubt, you can also ask uh, for a kind of uh, binding tariff information here in Brazil. It's basically a little bit the same procedure uh, as in Belgium. Uh, but therefore, you have to contact the Receita Federal. And sometimes I receive questions from companies or people that want to import certain goods into Brazil, and they ask me, what is my uh, NCM code? So I can only give them an advice. I will uh, search on the website, uh, that is mentioned here, and I give them the subdivisions. But the only authority that can give the correct code is, in fact, the Receita Federal. Um, that's the that's the thing. But you can also the Brazilian importer can always ask for a kind of binding tariff information. Next slide. I'm almost there. What is important to know? Uh, your required documents uh, for export from the Belgian point of view. Uh, you will you will definitely need uh, the commercial invoice, the bill of lading, or the airway bill. Because otherwise, uh, yeah, the the consignee here in Brazil cannot uh, take uh, the goods uh, that you have sent. Then also a packing list and of course the export declaration. What is uh, what can be additional documents that may be required, uh, dependent on the product that is exported. Uh, the certificate of origin. There I refer to the chambers of commerce and also health or export certificates from the um, uh, federal agency for the safety of the food chain and some export licenses from uh, other governmental bodies like if you want to export dual use good, uh, CITES, FAUNA and FLORA protected goods, you will need a 
specific uh, certificate. Please, the next slide. Then uh, for the import, uh, what I want to stress is uh, that it's basically uh, the Brazilian importer that has to make sure that all the documents uh, for the Brazilian import are there. Uh, it's not your business as a Belgian exporter to do that, but I would recommend you that you also do that kind of exercise. If you have a uh, deal with a Brazilian company uh, for the first time, then you can check the trustworthy uh, of the company or of the manager by talking about what is needed in terms of import into Brazil. You can see if he has done his homework properly. So it's kind of double check and I would recommend that you do that. Although uh, you cannot ask for the import license here because you have no access to the Cisco Max system. Uh, so, on the Brazilian side, you, of course, need the import declaration and then also sometimes import licenses. Uh, sometimes they are uh, automatically provided uh, via the Cisco Max systems. You also have the system of the non-automatic uh, licenses, but I will not go into detail because <laughs> Uh, otherwise, I will be talking for half an hour more. No, uh, you can find more information on uh, the websites uh, that I have provided here in this slide. Next uh, slide, please. So, uh, Belgian uh, sites uh, that you can consult on the EORI number. Uh, we have also um, questions and answers sections in these. Um, uh, sites, uh, who has to ask for an EORI number, how can you get it, how, have you, how do you have to do it, I mean, uh, within what time will it uh, be given to you, uh, yeah, okay, you can all find that information on this site, and also about our uh, tariff, um, you can uh, go to the Tarbell uh, website, to have, an, uh, to have a view of uh, the classification of the commodities and the tariffs if you want to import into Belgium, but also you can choose export and uh, yeah, it's very useful. Okay, you can uh, go down. Next slide, please. Yeah, what I would uh, recommend you to do is do your homework, avoid headaches and additional costs, do uh, market research. Uh, yeah, uh, will there be a market for your product uh, in Brazil, your taxes to be paid upon importation? I have um, um, shown you the link to the websites of the Receita Federal of the Cisco Mix system. Please go uh, and take a look at them, uh, try to do some exercises and you will see that you get a lot of information. Also on the general website of the Receita Federal, there is a section uh, about importation, about customs value. You can find a lot of information online. So please look at it before you start your big adventure. Uh, you can also find information of uh, import permits or certificates that are needed. Uh, check the necessary time to get customs clearance. Check also if all logistical issues are solved or met. Uh, please choose carefully and check your business partner. Has he uh, done um, things before and are people happy with them, his business partners uh, of the past? Uh, I would also recommend this trust and slowly build up trust and some good stories uh, that they tell you are too good to be true and that has to ring a bell in your head. Next slide, the last one. Uh, so also be aware of uh, the difference in standards, uh, your uh, unconscious uh, EU glasses, because the world is like you perceive it. Uh, your negotiating uh, capacities. Uh, Brazilian people are very good uh, negotiators. Uh, they like to talk a lot. Uh, and so you have to be careful sometimes. Uh, the possible language barriers. Uh, most Brazilian websites, also the legislation, is in Portuguese. And Portuguese uh, differs from Spanish. 
and also be aware of the complexity of the Brazilian uh, society. Uh, it's another world here in Brazil than it's in Europe. So thank you very much for your um, for your attention. You know where to find me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sorry. Karen. And uh, we will move quickly to the next one. And this is Felipe Cabral, CEO of uh, Cargo Action Cargo. Felipe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rodrigo. I will. Well, Karim just made it harder for me. I'll try to keep the standard up. And Dirk, if you need uh, help with the food and beer, we can help you import, but it might cost you at least a few drinks. So we'll have to negotiate there. Um, I, will, I will try to make, this is a very complex subject and I know most of the viewers probably even had some experience with Brazilian customs in the past. I know how famous it is. Um, I'll try to cover the complexity on a very superficial level because we only have uh, 10 minutes, but let, let's try to see if we can at least make it look like uh, Brazilian customs can be a little bit easier than you expect. Some of the things will be have already been mentioned by Karine, so I'll try to give the Brazilian perspective of what she, she brought us. So the first thing is indeed customs belongs to the federal revenue service so there's two key words which is federal and fiscal um, this might explain why all the fines are so expensive this might ex explain why customs is so tricky on or picky most of the times with some of the key factors that we will mention later on next one please so customs has created a single platform. Brazilian government has created a single platform that will explain a lot on how they control things. So there's one single server that will connect the Receita Federal, Customs, Central Bank, and all the other agencies that will be involved in, in the foreign trade. And this is why they can identify errors or uh, differences for example, if um, an importer claims that the cargo is 100,000 euro, but then they make a payment to the exporter in, in Europe of 200,000 euro, then there will be a huge difference that will be identified and customs can relate to that. So all the agencies will be always connected and the server now is doing a lot of in artificial intelligence to get that done. Now, talking about the agencies that will be involved, I have put uh, three logos here, but on the next slide, please, you will see the name of all the agencies. So depending on your product, you might be just dealing with customs, but maybe you have to deal with the army or with MAPA or with Anvisa, uh, like Karine mentioned. And so before uh, sending, starting a new business relationship is good to understand who, will, who from the Brazilian government will be involved and what are the requests that they will make so you're not surprised at the last moment. That makes us move into basic documents. Uh, next one, please. And the key information. There is a lot to be covered. But these would be already the first things that you would like to at least make sure that you have uh, when you're dealing with Brazilian customs. Everything starts with the original bill of lading or airway bill, depending if it's air or ocean, the original invoice and the original packing list. These three documents are completely mandatory for 100% of the Brazilian imports. Unless there is a specific mention on the NCM that another agency or another document is necessary with these three documents and a simple contact with Brazilian customs, this is all you need to import. But what information is important on these documents and, and that cannot be, that cannot have an error or cannot be missing? So customs, like we said, wants to identify the fiscal side of it. The first thing is they know they want to know who's importing. 
So the tax ID of the company, the Brazilian CNPJ, that's the first thing they want to look at. Then secondly, they want to know what you're bringing. The well-explained NCM, the Brazilian HS code. So what are you bringing? Then customs can identify what is your duty attached to that product. How much of that product do you want to bring? And one of the measuring of quantity for customs, of course, if it's physical, if it's something easy to count, you can count in pieces, but they will always look into the cargo weight. Once they know the gross and the net weight, they already know average on all the statistics from Cisco Max from the previous years of all of the importers. So they know how much that would weight and how many pieces they would have. Statistics is something that Cisco Max covers very, very well. Then last but not least, all duties and taxes on the imports are covered over, calculated over the CIF value. And they want to know how much you're charging the Brazilian importer to make sure that there's no tricky under, under mentioning of values and there are no wrong calculations. So you can see that the key points will always be related to the taxation side of it. So now talking about the flow on the next slide, please. So the basic flow for a Brazilian import starts on the arrival. Once cargo arrives to any port or dry port, the terminal will receive and register at Cisco Max the cargo presence. That is the first step that allows the importer or the customs broker on behalf of the importer to register the import declaration. The import declaration is registered in Cisco Max and all the documents are uploaded. The server will run a random, but not so random. There's a lot of inter uh, artificial intelligence in the background. It will run a risk assessment that is called a parametrization on, on this side, where customs is going to say your product is immediately released on a green channel. Your product will require a document inspection on yellow channel or even physical and document inspection on red channel. This will affect the cost, the time, the storage, and everything else uh, related to your, your product getting to your final customer. I haven't mentioned the gray channel. It also exists. Maybe some of you have uh, heard of it before. The gray channel is directly attached to the price. So if all Belgian beers are important at a cost of three euro per can, if somebody now imports the same product for one euro, there will be a gray channel. There will be a cost uh, analysis. Once the red channel and the yellow channel are dealt with, it becomes green or if you have an immediate green. So the next step is you pay all the duties, you pay all the taxes, you get all the final releases and then cargo can be finally scheduled to be removed from the port. Now we covered a little bit of the key points before, but I want on the next slide to explore a little bit deeper on, onto that. And Karine has mentioned, uh, I think all of them, but covering them again. So the first thing is the importer of record in Brazil must be a Brazilian local registered company and authorized as an importer exporter. That means they need to have the radar. So if your customer doesn't have a radar, then they need to come to a customs broker um, and then they need to get that license. <clears throat> also, very important to avoid problems with the wood. 100% of the products imported in Brazil will have the wood controlled. Um, so all of the wood used in the containers, in the packing, or even on the pallet, they must be certified. If possible, add more than one stem. So if there's any damage to the crate or any damage to the to the pallet, right where the stamp used to be, it has to be very, the stamp has to be very clear so that MAPA can see and release. Um, the CNPJ, it's one of the tricky things that you cannot make a mistake. Um, 
CNPJ must be completely correct. There are fines attached to correction of CNPJ. The same is valid for the NCM. We highly recommend also if the importer is not ex an expert on your product that they go to a customs broker and reclassify all of their um, all of the goods that they want to to bring. Um, also, net and gross weight must be exact. There is a tolerance, a little tolerance, because of scale differences. Uh, we recommend that we keep it under five percent. The import license, a very important key point that that uh, Harine mentioned. In theory, all the products in Brazil have automatic import license given, except, and this is mentioned on the classification of the product you, you will know, unless there's a note that the import license must be given before departure from origin. If this doesn't happen for these products, then the fines will be very, very high. It will be very expensive and slow procedure to correct. The taxes again are calculated over the CIF value, and this is why it's mandatory to mention the real freight value on all the bills of ladies and AWBs. Um, when we have seen when companies that forget to mention that, or or there's a mistake on those numbers, you can also run into into issues. Um, containers properly sealed and the seals must be shown on, on the documentation correctly this is how customs wants to make sure that there has nothing been added or taken from the container before it arrives at, uh, at the official brazilian customs entry point so last slide we we can cover that uh, even though we don't have much time but we can easily cover case by case um, everything in Brazilian customs is, is good to analyze on case by case basis. Make sure that you find a, a trustworthy importer with a trustworthy customs broker. And, and this is how, in our case, this is how we usually do it. So we start with a pre shipment full study. We want to know how this is coming, what is it. We reclassify all the products if necessary to make sure we have covered the CNPJ, the NCM, the weights and everything. Once that study is done, and the study is even more important when we're talking about temporary imports or machinery or something that is not a regular consumer goods, uh, then we in, in theory authorize the customers to start the shipment. We are highly recently started for a few years now, we're highly recommending companies to join the AEO program um, Brazil is trying to bring more and more customs, uh, more and more companies into the customs AEO program. Uh, Action has been probably the fifth or the sixth freight forwarder to be registered, and we are seeing now all of the good results our customers are getting. Previous to shipment or previous to arrival, customs clearance, um, reductions on some demands, especially on when it's a temporary import priorities on on registrations and dealing with issues and a direct contact with customs so we are seeing customers uh, enjoying many advantages on that and last but not least we also may recommend to choose the destination carefully the destination can be a logistics point of view close to the final delivery point but sometimes maybe we can also find something easier to deal with when you find customs that are dry ports or customs airports or ports that are more uh, used to a certain product. Let's say pharmaceuticals or high-end and expensive uh, electronics. There are dry ports that are usually getting some of the more of those products. So customs dealing with these dry ports would be ideally the best Point of context to discuss. So we may uh, we may recommend sometimes that you look into where you're sending and where which customs you want to deal with. Um, I hope I have uh, covered most of it. I think we'll, we move now to the last slide. But 
I know it's a complicated subject. I hope I have been made somehow it easier to understand and I'm at your disposal if uh, further explanations are necessary. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, Felipe. Thank you, Felipe, Thank you. and for your expertise and as well of Karen. And uh, don't forget that both Karen and Felipe uh, are at your disposal should you have any question and should you want to start exporting uh, to Brazil. Um, Leonardo, who was waiting a little bit uh, because we are a little bit late according to our schedule. Leonardo, hey, Rodrigo. Hey, Rodrigo, thanks for your presentation. And uh, first of all, I would like to say hi, everyone, uh, all the listeners that is, are following our presentation here. And I would like to thank to all the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very glad, I'm very happy to be part of this presentation, this webinar. And put my experiences on it as a Brazilian guy and uh, as I'm a lawyer uh, on tax matters. Uh, I'm the responsible for Puratos Brazil. We have a subsidiary here for 35, almost 40 years here in Brazil. And I'm at Puratos, uh, I have been working here for three years. I'm uh, responsible for tax and legal matters. And uh, as you can see, as uh, Karine said and Philippe said, we have a lot of uh, challenges here in Brazil. It's not easy to, to deal with customs agents and with the internal revenue service, but uh, it's not impossible. Uh, I think in the, the last years, we are going through new times here. All the import process and export process are more simple than uh, a very recent past. So I think it's, we have a lot of opportunities here. Of course, there is a high tax burden, but uh, if you have a good broker here, a good advice advisor in tax matters, you probably will have be succeed here in Brazil. Well, um, my presentation, I will focus in the harmonized system nomenclature and the tax uh, classification. I, I think it's a very important matter here in Brazil, uh, despite of all the the points that Karine and Philippe said of, regarding taxpayer number and other issues. Uh, I think the tax classification number is very important to to go deeper. So, uh, the, my, my first point here is just uh, present a golden rule that I use it to say here. Uh, would you please? Uh, go back to go uh, to the next slide, please. Well, uh, of course, there is different tables from uh, Eurozone and Brazil area, so uh, it's mandatory to to cross the numbers. Okay, uh, in Europe we have the harmonized system, as Karin exposed in a very clear way, and here in Brazil we have the Mercosul table. So I think the most important thing here, you have to be very attempt, uh, your importer here in Brazil, on the number of the commodity number to go to respect the six uh, digit number, the first six ones, and just uh, change the two ones. It, it be, uh, as you, uh, you, you ask from me, oh, it's very uh, basic, this. Okay, it's basic, but it's very important to respect the six first numbers. Why? Because if we consider another number, probably you will be assessed by our internal revenue service. Probably we will have a red channel, as Philippe explained it, and your headache will be very uh, bad, right? So it's very important. Uh, oh, but I don't agree with the number of the origin. Okay, uh, after that, we will discuss it with the technical uh, guy who put this number in the origin, but when the product uh, comes to Brazil, you have to respect the six numbers, okay? It's mandatory, otherwise you have the problem. So 
uh, most common mistakes, change the entire classification code, as I told, uh, a lot of companies in Brazil do this, okay? Because ah, I don't agree with this number, okay, but follow the six. <laughs> After that, to discuss, it's very important. Uh, if we, because as Philippe told, we have uh, the intelligence, artificial intelligence, and they cross everything, all the informations. So if you have uh, a red light, probably you will have the uh, physical inspection uh, and you will be assessed, you will receive fines as we can see in the, the other slide. But this is the most common. And they do not apply correctly the last two digits. This is another uh, discussion. I think it's not uh, a big problem like the first one, but you have to be attempt. So I give a, a simple example here. I put the table of Eurozone, right? And you put uh, a part of Mercosul Brazil uh, area. So uh, we are talking about the same product here. Others uh, is a, a food preparation that you, we normally use here in Puratos. We have a lot of products uh, under this classification. So uh, you have to be very attempt. Uh, normally uh, I'm here, uh, I'm in, uh, re responsible for uh, attribute the NCM number here in Brazil. And normally I have these two tables with me. It's very important to have both tables side by side. So it, it, it will be difficult to, to commit a mistake, right? It's very important. Sometimes you will not have the, the exactly correspondence, but uh, you can deal another, use another, but never change the first digits. This is mandatory. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. Well, I, here I will go, will go deeper in the custom duties in Brazil. I think uh, maybe it's scary, but uh, it's important to to have this in mind. Well, if you use a, an incorrect uh, commodity code, an incorrect tax classification, you have some consequence. First of, of, of all, you have the physical inspection by customs authorities that we call here the red channel, right? This is terrible because the agent will uh, exam examine all your documents and you have a delay on the release of the products, right? Uh, sometimes you have months and months of discussion. It's not good. So it's very important to be very attentive with the, all the documents, all the information you provide. Uh, you have to, to work. There is no doubt of, about it with a very trustworthy broker and ad advisor for, for tax and this kind of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking by experience. I, I worked as a lawyer a long, for long, long years in uh, law firms here in Brazil. And some, that is very common to have this kind of problem. And then you have tax assessments and you have uh, judicial suits. Of, uh, it's terrible. And they have to uh, raising, raising, raising until you don't have a, a final decision on it. It's, it's not a good deal. So be always attentive on this. Uh, well, what the other point here, okay, I, I will specify some fines that we have. Uh, sometimes you put uh, a classification, right? But uh, our having no service says no, it's another. So uh, in this another, you have a higher rate, for example. So they will charge the difference of this, this tax with fines and interest, of course, and plus a 70% five percent of fine right uh, it's a very heavy fine but uh, when you have a tax assessment automatically they put this fine right and this fine can be uh, raised for in the double 155 percent if the tax authority uh, consider that there is some fraud or other thing oh but it's very subjective yes it's very subjective. It's not, <laughs> there's no, uh, no guidelines for it. If they decide in their minds that there is some kind of fraud or something uh, like this, they will 
raise the double of this fine, right? So it's very important to be uh, very concerned about the information provided to them. Uh, other fine that you have uh, cumulative in a cumulative way is the one percent uh, one percent of customs value for in impaired tax classification. This one is automatically if they consider the the tax you, classification you adopt is incorrect, they will put this one percent over the customs value, right? Uh, besides that, uh, if you are you are obliged to uh, have the import license, as Philip said in his presentation, uh, you have a very high fine of 30% over customs value, right? Uh, this, this is a very heavy uh, penalty. We don't have anything to discuss about it. If you, for example, if you bring drugs, food, uh, toys, for example, among others, you have to previously have this license, right? The import license. Otherwise, you will have this fine, right? And uh, all the fines are cumulative, right? Uh, and the, the, the your bill will be very high. So we can move to the next presentation. The next slide, please. Well, uh, I, I bring here to you just to to illustrate, right? Uh, a case that we have in Curatos. Né? Curatos uh, was assessed by Internal Revenue Service in 2015, right? For incorrect tax classification, right? And at that time, we used another classification. You, we incurred in the first mistake I, I told in the first slide. Uh, in my, in, uh, we, we used another classification. You didn't, we didn't just change the last two digits. We used another. For example, the exporter said they were sending banana. And then we told here that was pineapple, right? So I think we we, get, we we got the worst scenario here, and the tax, uh, of course, the the tax authority identified this one cross the information, and then they assessed this, they put a tax assessment on this, and for the new classification that they suggested, should suggest this, <laughs> they put. The, the charge or the charge the difference, the, the, the original one you used to pay import tax uh, under the rate of 8%, but they said, no, you have to use the other classification and you have the 16%. So they charge the difference. They input a, a fine of 75% because we have the tax assessment, a formal tax assessment. And we had uh, the fine of 30% regarding the lack of the license importation because the, this new product we have the, the it was mandatory to have this license so you can imagine the the size of the tax assessment here now we, they basically look the five year operations that you had the tax assessment was uh, put in place 2015 but they come back to the five years, previous years, 2010. So they considered a lot of import declarations and we have a huge uh, charge here. So at that time you have to hire uh, a tax firm, right? To present a defense. And for since that time we have, uh, we don't have a first grade decision. So we don't know how uh, the internal revenue service will uh, go through this way because the first grade here it's composed by uh, internal revenue service representatives uh, the, the, the same guy that presents you the tax ass assessment his colleague will decide this first grade decision and after that if we have an unfavorable decision we will have to appeal and then we'll go to another court, right? To the second grade decision. So in this second grade, probably uh, we'll have a favorable decision because we have legal, uh, representatives from the society that uh, are lawyers and accountants and uh, very specialist guys that will decide this matter. And you have representatives from the treasury. So the decisions 
seems to be more fair. But here we are talking about proofs. So when the, our internal revenue service don't agree uh, with the tax classification about the tax classification, they, they send the product to a to to a, a company that will understand what is the composition, this kind of thing, and they follow this uh, report from them. And then, as we taxpayers here, we have to hire another company to present another report to the make front of front of, of this one. So the, the discussion goes deeply in very detailed uh, compositions and no, oh, you have to use this classification. No, oh, this one is correct. So the, this discussion can take a long time. So, and after that, if you have uh, unfavorable decision uh, in the administrative sphere, because here we are talking about administrative sphere, you can go through judicial sphere from the court, okay? And then you have a lot of, of years discussing this. Right, uh, so it's very important to keep in mind, you have to, to, to have a good broker and good advice since the beginning. Otherwise you can have this kind of problem and it's not good, it's, uh, it's expensive to, to deal with this because you have to hire lawyers and you have to present reports, technical reports, you have to, most, most of time in the judicial sphere, uh, the judge is not a uh, tax specialist, so you have to contract uh, a guy to present another report to explain in details what is the product, why you use this classification, not uh, that one that the treasury determined. And so this is my contribution here, the, talking in a very practical way, in a lawyer vision. Uh, of tax specialist, uh, and that's it. I would like you so much for for listening to me. And if you have any doubt, any issue, any problem, you can reach the organizers, and they will uh, give my contact to you to help you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Leonardo. Very interesting. Very technical. Uh, uh, we can see that you you understand a lot of the on this matter. Uh, so to the companies watching this webinar, uh, don't lose confidence and trust on the Brazilian market. It seems quite complicated, but uh, be sure that you can be assisted by the right people. Uh, Karin Willems, uh, uh, Felipe Cabral can help you in all these taxes. And as Leonardo has just very kindly said, he's working for Pluratos but he's very much willing also to help you guys if you have any question. Um, we'll move on to the testimony of uh, David Andreoli. And I will ask... Hello, hello everybody. Thanks to AWEX Sao Paulo and AWEX Brussels. Uh, my name is David Andreoli. I am founder and managing partner of Adoc International. We are based in uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Brazil since 2006. Uh, and we are experts in international business development with uh, a focus on developing small and medium uh, industries within Brazilian and European uh, small and medium retailers. Um, how we do that, how we do this, uh, we started our uh, history in Brazil, uh, investing in uh, um, a software house, a startup in Curitiba, state of Paraná, in 2010. Uh, this company is developing uh, SaaS, a software as a service uh, called PDV Check, that allows the industries and the distributors to control fields operations such as check in, check out of the sales guy or promoters, uh, routing optimization, uh, localization, uh, time in the shop optimization, and also store check and info information collecting. 
all those information, uh, uh, all this information is sent in is sent in a day-to-day -day, uh, report to our customers um, via web solution or via an, an app that they have. Um, to give an example, our main customer, European customer, is Pasta de Cieco, which is located in uh, in Italy. And uh, from Italy, they have uh, they are using PDV Check uh, to to evaluate their in-store positions, prices, and promo uh, uh, agreements that they do with their main customers in in Brazil, which is Pau de Açúcar, which is the biggest retailer in in Brazil. Um, doing this kind of business, we noticed three big issues for European uh, small and medium companies uh, who desired to enter the Brazilian market. The three main issues are uh, the first one, uh, usually too high requested MOQ to complete a full container, even 20 feet which is quite difficult sometimes for some products that they are proposed to the Brazilian retailer. The second issue is uh, how to find an easy way to secure payment to both. I mean, both mean, I mean, from, for the retailer, but also for the producers. Of course, there are big uh, companies making that, uh, banks, uh, Ducroix and all this stuff, but it's not always possible for small and medium companies, European small and medium companies to use them. And uh, it's not uh, agreed from all retailers in, in Brazil, mainly small and medium retailers. So we do uh, the business between them. And the third main issue is uh, the duties process in Brazil, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the point of topic today with all my colleagues that will explain also from their experience. So resuming, we, we allow small and medium uh, producing company to enter the Brazilian market, uh, taking care of two main points, the logistic, we do a groupage and we put together a different kind of product and invoicing. And the main point is that we, we, we let we leave the sales and promotion activities in the producer hands. It remains for them. So coming back for the, uh, the, the, the biggest issue today, so the, the duties, the process, and um, we, I would like to explain you how we proceed. And explaining you, I'm giving you, according to our experience, uh, who are the seven players in this game, this game that I, that I called uh, exporting food uh, premium in, uh, in Brazil. Why am I insisting on food premium? Um, because we are not, we have no added value. Uh, we have no experience and we have no added value in exporting and helping big companies and exporting commodities. Um, so we are uh, specialized in a special products because of, so of our experience, 20 year experience in food industry. Uh, and that is the focus. And to do that, we, 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 we noticed that we have seven big players uh, in this game. The first one, which is one of the most important, of course, is the producer. Um, is the producer ready to export to Brazil? Brazil is a very demanding country. It's a big country it's a, with big opportunities, but very demanding and complicated. So uh, do they have a, a, market in, a market inquiry, for instance? Do they have a store check to see what are the competitors' prices? And uh, are they ready to make special label for uh, the Brazilian market? Uh, ready to, to produce smaller batch production? Uh, are they ready to do degustations, for instance? So uh, they need to have uh, fumigated pallets, for instance, and to produce also documents such as uh, uh, origin certificates for uh, the duty in Brazil. So a lot of documents, a lot of documents, um, and the question is, is the producer ready to do that, to invest in this kind of, of, of process? The second player is the exporter. We are the exporter, so I will go fast on that. We usually ask three kinds of prices, uh, FOB uh, prices Antwerp, FOB Genova, or FOB Le Havre. They are the three ports we work. And uh, we have uh, the third part, the third players, which are the logisticians, 
two kind of logisticians, the local, the European one, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, responsible for collecting all the goods and uh, also for dealing every day with uh, the, the European duty. And the other logistician is the transport uh, from Europe to uh, Brazil. We usually let this uh, responsibility to the fourth player, uh, which is uh, the importer or the trade company in Brazil. This company is uh, responsible for uh, taking care of uh, transport to Brazil and all the process with the local duty uh, using what we call a despachante, which is a one responsible of this kind of business, local business. We, you need to have this kind of business locally. Uh, even uh, we are there in Brazil since 2006 and the company 2010. Uh, it's a special business. They are located in the port, so they can have direct uh, relationship with uh, the duty, which may help when sometimes uh, you don't have the green light of the container and you, you have to deal with them. So it's very important to have those guys. The fifth uh, and the sixth uh, player uh, are first the distributor, which is different of the importer. The important business is to import and to let the goods available to the distributor or to the retailers when the retailers is able to organize his logistic uh, in, uh, in, uh, in receiving the goods from Europe. This kind of business, this kind of product are usually mainly uh, dealt with a distributor because it's easier, but, but we deal also direct with some retailers, more as one uh, that, can, that are able to import also different kinds of products in one time, one container. So this is the fifth and the sixth uh, players. The seventh player, which is the most important, according to me, is the shopper. Who is the Brazilian shopper? How is uh, behaving in the shops? So we need to have degustations uh, to let the product be discovered by the, the shoppers, the Brazilian shoppers. The Brazilian shoppers, is, that can be also a, a, a special topic for next time. Uh, this is my invitation to Rodrigo and to Sylvian and our expressors. But retailers and shoppers in Brazil, it's quite different from the regions, all the regions, of course, the Brazilian people who is dealing with that, they know that exactly. So it's very important to know them and to know them, we have to uh, uh, do store check with them to make inquiry, degustation, test and all this stuff. So those are the seven, the seven biggest players I work with we work with as ad hoc in uh, brazil so producer exporter the logisticians local europe and uh, transport importer dealing with uh, brazilian duty distributor doing distribution business in different state and region of brazil retailer and finally the shop so i think i said uh, uh, what I thought it was, let's say, an introduction of this, uh, this kind of, uh, of business we do. Uh, I thanks a lot and uh, for your kind attention. I'm, I'm sorry not to be there uh, this time, but uh, the Ukrainian situation for me is very difficult for me, for everybody, sorry. But I have to deal with uh, a lot of in increasing cost. We are also... Um, uh, share order in a producing company in Italy, and we have big problem with uh, with the floor and with the uh, sunflower olive oil and uh, sunflower oil and olive oil and all this stuff. So I had to go to Germany today, and I will not be able to be there with you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, please excuse me for that. I wish to all of you to have a, a lot of success, and um, may feel free to uh, Rodrigo and Sivian feel free to give my contacts to everybody who may may need more information or, or help. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Ciao. Até logo. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Michel uh, Freisen from Mainland of Brazil. Uh, I won't be able to participate at the live on, on the webinar understand the Brazilian customs uh, because at that time I will be on my way to South Africa, so I recorded this video uh, answering to the kind invitation of uh, Rodrigo from the Alex and Paul and uh, trying to, to share my my 12 years experience now uh, of being importing 
from Belgium or from elsewhere in, the, in Brazil. Uh, I'm the founder and managing partner of Emulev de Brazil. Uh, we are manufacturing and refactory coatings here, uh, products which are dedicated to the steel industry and a uh, ferrous one. And uh, we, st uh, we established a company in October 2014, and for the last uh, seven and a half years now, we have been imported uh, raw material uh, from different countries. Uh, today, and as much as possible, we are trying to source locally um, our, our components, but still uh, we have to import some, some of them from abroad. And uh, this is what I would like to, to, to share with you. Uh, you know, there is a, there's a wording here in Brazil, a kind of joke, and they say that uh, uh, Brazil is not for the weak. Uh, Meaning you have to be <laughs> strong, patient, and trying to uh, to avoid headache. And this could be avoided by following some very basic uh, advice, uh, which uh, I will try to, to share with you. Uh, my experience started then uh, back to seven and a half years, when it was about importing the equipment from from Belgium. Uh, this equipment. Uh, was for our manufacturing unit and from that moment we understood that it wouldn't be uh, the easiest part of the, of the process and uh, due to specific uh, circumstances our equipment uh, has been stuck uh, for almost one month uh, at the customs and um, besides the fact that you have to pay uh, beforehand all the taxes when uh, importing the goods here uh, we had to pay a lot of uh, storage fees and then the, the bill was very uh, much higher than uh, expected and uh, from that uh, very negative and bad experience uh, we felt that uh, we really need uh, from local uh, help and uh, this local help uh, is called a Despachant Adouanaire it's a custom agent basically and I can, uh, I can tell you that the uh, it's really, really important to have these type of people on, on your side. Um, I will not uh, draw the, the profile of this uh, custom agent, but basically there are people who uh, they are skilled in this matter. This is the, the, uh, the daily tasks, so they definitely uh, know how to deal with the documentation, uh, with the processes, they know the people and the customs. Uh, when you're importing a port, generally they are also uh, locally implemented uh, and, and based uh, close to the, uh, the ports or the, the airports, so they know the people that are dealing uh, daily with these guys, so they can make it things a little bit uh, smoother whenever there is some uh, small complication. But uh, this is definitely uh, the kind of, of support that you will uh, you will need uh, for sure in Brazil, and. Uh, their assistance starts before uh, the importation uh, process itself really started. Uh, by the, the good writing and, uh, of, of the documentation, you know, uh, this bill of ladings or packing list uh, or invoices has to be uh, written down in the, the right way uh, to avoid any, any further issue when you are importing. So doing that beforehand I believe it is going to save you guys uh, time, money, and, uh, and headache. Uh, so this is now part of our routine. Uh, we we are asking our supplier uh, to to forward all the, the documentation before uh, before st uh, starting the exportation process. So our custom agents make this uh, deep and tricky analysis of all this and give uh, feedback on. The, documentation so we can advise our supplier uh, to make the, the requested uh, already required uh, adjustment on the documentation. Uh, I will give you an example uh, from uh, an importation which give us some, some trouble, some concern. It was about uh, the bill of lading, the weight was uh, informed in tons while on the invoice the weight was informed in, in kilos. Can say at the, uh, at the end of the day it's uh, it's the same good with the same weight, but uh, apparently not for the Brazilian customs. So we have to uh, to change all the documentation, 
it took time and time is money uh, while uh, your good is stuck at the, at the custom we have to pay all the daily fees for, for the storage so uh, again uh, we paid to, uh, to learn and uh, how uh, how to avoid this uh, this difficult moment uh, it was really to uh, the local system of, of a custom agent um, you know you can save now everything harmonize um, you can harmonize uh, systems with the custom code stuff like that that's very true but still Brazil has some uh, specificities you know the six uh, four uh, first numbers are all the same worldwide but then uh, or remaining uh, are the tricky part of the uh, of, of the matter. So uh, your custom agent can help you to choose the right uh, custom code, and then uh, you will have to explain very uh, carefully in detail what is about your goods or your equipment. Uh, Try to explain uh, uh, the best of your equipment capabilities. Uh, which type of equipment, uh, for, for which purpose it's, it's important, and stuff like that, you know. And then from then that, from that on, you can check in, in the tables uh, how uh, and which uh, customs code has to be chosen. Uh, also, to, be, to optimize, you know, all the importation uh, taxes, which could be very high here in, in Brazil. So, uh, definitely, this type of uh, support and assistance, I, I highly recommend. Uh, to be surrounded by uh, people of, uh, uh, for, for this purpose, you know. so uh, probably uh, Rodrigo and the AVEX and we can also maybe uh, recommend some, some person uh, which are really in the business for, for, for years. I will recommend to choose people which, uh, who are really uh, for, for, for a long time in, in the customs uh, business and they have a strong reputation, so they know all the people, and they, they know uh, how to avoid, you know, um, some some big issues, some big problem in terms of uh, avoiding to be delayed uh, for, for goods to be uh, stuck at the uh, at the custom for really sometimes very stupid uh, uh, things uh, and details on on, on, on the document. Okay, so uh, I really. Uh, will conclude that uh, uh, it's difficult but it's not impossible uh, so I believe that uh, you have to follow uh, the, pipe, the, the path of, uh, of wisdom which is uh, from my advice uh, to look after uh, a custom agent, uh, skilled people, pe uh, people with a good reputation on the, uh, on the market and uh, which will be on your side for the whole process from the very uh, early moment of the exportation process for you, but the importation uh, here. So uh, this will really avoid you guys uh, headache and uh, saving time and, and, and money. So I uh, wish you all the best in all your uh, businesses. Uh, maybe we'll meet uh, in Brazil or in, in Belgium anyway. I hope my experience will help you from one way or another. Uh, we can be uh, you can be in touch at any time to uh, Rodrigo and Alex if you want to, to, to know a little bit more about uh, my experience here. It would be a pleasure to share that with you again. So uh, in the meantime, wish you all the best and uh, good luck. Take care. Stay safe.